nice to have you back here at the Institute of Making. And it's fabulous to be back. One of our favourite makers. Oh, very kind. I love the thing that over Battenberg cake, we always cook up a fabulous idea, and I hope that everybody this evening is going to love what I'm going to talk about. Let's see. They always do. You're such a fantastic speaker, and it's, <laughs> it's brilliant because you really grasp the nettle with regards to what the topic of our festival is, which is just stuff, and it's such an expansive topic. But you're like, I know what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Stuff of smell, the molecules, let's yeah. get down to it. Well, I thought, um, so this particular one, if you remember, you were telling me about your blue stuff which yes. I want a piece of, but I'm sure I'll never own, which na you told me Nasa made that, and it was to catch stardust, so I'd like a bit in case there's stardust around. But um, anyhow, that's, that's, that's the only reason I really came to see if I could put on a piece, but... Oh, it's in there. I, I know now. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll get you a bit. So, yeah, the, so this evening I thought it was interesting to look at how chemistry has helped creativity, or how creativity fuels the work of the chemist, because the two are symbiotic and modern perfumery, which began way back in 1882, couldn't exist without the things the chemists give us. And without any exception, I always give the simile, you'll tell me if it's any good or not, but I always say, if you think of a cotton t-shirt, by the end of the day it looks terrible, but someone invented elastin or spantex, 1% of that makes the cotton better. So I want to look at what did the chemists give us and how did the great perfumers use those raw materials to push perfumery off in new directions and make great classics. That's fantastic because well chemistry, I mean as a discipline, chemistry couldn't have existed without that artisan craftsmanship that was glass makers. Like chemistry is defined by test tubes, glassware, where you have liquids inside yeah. and you can heat it up and you can look at it. You can't do chemistry without glass and you can't make glass without the craftspeople who knew how to manipulate this material. It's inextricably linked yeah. to craft and making. And um, of course the glass bottle as Shakespeare said, a liquid prisoner pent in walls of glass. Yeah. So this evening I will be really releasing both molecules, but also the end perfumes, uh, some of which are exceptionally rare, so I hope that all of the guests coming this evening love the experience of them. It's going to be such a treat. <laughs> I mean, in fact, because we want to make this evening you know, interesting in lots of different dimensions, yep. and we're serving drinks, we need to look at the material of those drinks. Is this my glass for gin? Well, this could be. This God. is this is a piece That's of tree. <laughs> <laughs> this is uranium glass. So this is oh. glass that had uranium mixed in with the sand, and then when it's made, it gives it this certain colour. But under ultraviolet light, it sort of iridescent. It does. Let me show you. You can just put a UV light on it, and then you start to see this really vibrant, Draw vivid. Back. You know, is lurid it, green. Is it? Can you still make this? Or it's now not allowed. I mean, you could, but it isn't really allowed. You can't um, sell it for anything you're going to eat or drink out of. But you can buy it still in second yeah, shops. It's but they amazing. Should, yeah. it? What I always find incredible with things like that is who thought of it. Is it you know, one day it didn't exist and one day it did. So yeah. what I love about craft and creativity is that someone one day had the idea to do this thing and. Often it's never documented as to what what made them think to do it. Sometimes an accident, sometimes I'm sure it was thought through a process. But that's why it's so important to play and be curious and spend time with stuff, not just reading about it, but playing with it and using it. Because it's in the doing, you learn something and you then notice things. And that's you know, totally. hands-on experience. 100%, 100%, yeah. 100 so. In fact, when you were learning your art, would you say that there were things you noticed that you couldn't even have words to describe? Like Often. But I think often, I think the whole thing with perfumery that's uh, interesting is that the language is totally subjective. So we tend to always draw on a reference we have, an experience, normally an experience, to describe mm -hmm. odour. So I think that um, the articulation of uh, a scent is very, very difficult. So one of the things I try to do is explain the scent through an idea I've had through comparing and contrasting to see whether I can help you understand what my thought was. Yeah, because you have sense. your, your um, what is it, your smell organ? Yes, that's your organ. Your real, <laughs> the your that's a kind of, that's a, it's a language, isn't it? It's a, you know, totally. a, a language of smell, but then you need your, to develop your own lexicon to explain that experience that... Totally. And then you need to communicate with that with the audience. What's so great is you are a fantastic communicator, and that really comes Thank across. You. But I think, for me, it must come from a deep understanding of your material, actually, and, yeah. I think 100% it's that, and I, I've always loved the thing, art of communication, for want of a term. So I've always wanted people, I hope this isn't arrogant, I've always wanted people to understand smell the way I smell it. 
So I have sort of developed a language and so on, which helps people hopefully do just that. Yeah, and I think it's so difficult to talk about something sensory and us to have this conversation without starting to reach for things. Totally. Because which, we're those sorts of people. Which is why this evening I think we're giving out about 40 or so different odours for smell. The thing that I always say about my, my work, my sphere, my craft, is that my job is to make the tangible from the intangible. Um, I don't think that's true of everything, but the smell, of course, is something you can't touch. And yet, this is my idea. Well, you're well. <laughs> It sounds like a number plate. <laughs> Better than a number two. <laughs> totally. Well, there we are. So that's the tone of the evening. Yeah. <laughs> so all sorts of stuff seems to be spoken about that it's the scene. But I'm sure that all the guests will have It's such, be such a treat as well. This is some fluorescent paint, which, again, will be excited by the ultraviolet light and glow. But what this has is also is a persistence. So this is oh, going so to it stay. It. Yeah. So normally, you take the input away and the output of the light, the green glow disappears. But here, light glow in the dark stuff, it stays a little bit. And when you say it's it excited up. by it, what does that mean? The molecule happens to the molecule? Yeah, basically the electrons jump okay. and they give off light as they settle back down. So they change well, and they, get, they get, uh -huh. literally get excited, they're hopping up and down. And then we see that as light. Let's hope the audience is going to hop up and down this evening, but not too much. I hope they're excited then. <laughs>